welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for showing up on a Monday on the last day of the conference. Uh, I'm Sean Parent. I'm a principal scientist at Adobe. Uh, I've given a number of talks over the years, so I know a number of you. I've spoken at a lot of conferences. Uh, this talk is a little outside the talks I usually give. It's a talk on the relationship between better code and a better human interface. So it's a little outside of my typical uh, uh, better code talks. Um, I'll, when I give a talk, I like to give a talk that's related, at least tangentially, to what I'm working on. And so Jens asked me to give this talk a, a year or so ago at Meeting C++, and I gave it there. Um, uh, and you, human interfaces, user interfaces, are something I spend a lot of time with and that I've spent a lot of time working on. Uh, Marshall asked me, just before I came on, about the artwork, what this actually is, the brush strokes. Uh, I'm bringing it up only because every time I give a talk, somebody asks, where do you get your artwork? Well, working at Adobe, we have a collection of templates that branding puts out and updates every six months or so. And so whenever I give a talk, I go and I try to just pick one of their templates uh, that's approved, that matches the theme somewhat. So since this is about human interface and design, I thought this was a nice artistic piece to go with this talk. Um, human interfaces we bump into all the time, and they waste a huge amount of our time. Bad human interfaces do. I don't think we give enough thought about them. Uh, uh, just standing up here before the conference, the little device over here is a timer that I can see. And as it was leading up to the talk, the background went green to let me know that it was pre-talk, and the numbers went red uh, uh, to let me know that I was getting close to the time. Who knows what the problem with that is? Yeah, if I were colorblind, I don't think I would have been able to read it at all, right? I, I mean, it literally looked like a test you would take to see if you were colorblind. Um, <laughs> so, you bump into these things. Um, uh, when I give a talk at a conference, I also like to open things up for a conversation for the rest of the conference. Uh, since this is not a keynote, I'm not leading off the conference. Uh, but maybe this will give you some ideas of things to talk about during the day. So these were talks that I'm not giving uh, for various reasons. Uh, better code design and ethics. Uh, question here, is there a moral imperative uh, to create better designs, better software, better human interfaces. Uh, I think it's an interesting topic. Uh, the reason why I'm not giving this talk is because today, specifically like at this moment, uh, I think there are much greater moral issues going on in the world. So this would be a little trite. Uh, futures are not monads. <laughs> or maybe not just monads. Uh, Bresenham's algorithm, who, who knows what Bresenham's algorithm is? Yeah, algorithm for drawing lines. Uh, so I've been doing some interesting work with Bresenham algorithms and, and uh, 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 much faster Bresenham algorithms with uh, no compares and no branches. Uh, and I think there's an interesting talk there, interesting history, but I haven't finished the work, so I'm not gonna give that talk yet. Um, old guy reminiscing. My badge that I've been walking around with at the conference is how old is generic programming? Uh, the answer I will give, give to you all now is 30 years. 30 years ago today, uh, or not today, 30 years ago this year, uh, Dave Masser and Alex Stepanoff uh, published a paper titled Generic Programming. That's where the, the term generic programming was coined. Uh, the number of people who I've had conversations with at this conference, when I said it's 30 years old, they're like, oh, well, that's about two or three years before I was born. Um, 30 years ago, I worked at Apple in system software group, so, so there's lots that I could reminisce about as an old guy. Uh, but today's talk, we are talking about better code human interface. Um, a lot of this talk comes out of a comment that Darren Adler, I think Darren now runs the Safari group at Apple. He and I worked at Apple you know, 30 years ago. Uh, in fact, he's one of the reasons why I got my job at Apple. I, he made this statement, at least this is to the best of my recollection, but I actually sent him this quote and he said, yeah, he remembers the conversation. 
And, and uh, uh, he remembers saying something to this effect. That's the, the purpose of a human interface is not to hide what the code does, but to accurately convey what the code does. Okay? What you're trying to do when you build a human interface is create a mental model in the user's mind of what's going on under the hood. Okay? All too often, I see human interfaces where it's very clear that the designer of the human interface never really talked to the engineer. They never understood what the constraints were or what it was they were trying to convey. Okay? They were trying to create an illusion of how they wished it worked, not of how it actually works. Right? And the problem with that is those lies, and that's what you're doing when you do that, you are lying to the user about how the system works, uh, 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 those lies don't hold up and they peek through. And users create magical rules. Right, right. How many times have you talked uh, with a family member who's kind of not in the industry, and they will tell you like, oh yes, you know, whenever I save this document, I do this other thing. And they might as well have said, you know, I stand on one, one foot and pat the top of my head because otherwise it doesn't work. Right? Right? They're creating a little magical thinking, trying to explain to themselves what it does, because when they take this set of actions, once at least, it did what they wanted. So we can't lie to the user. So my goal is always don't lie. Um, I wanted to set a little context here, because I think it's important whenever somebody gives a talk to understand what kind of world they live in. Uh, uh, this is Photoshop. Uh, when I joined Adobe 25 years ago, I started on this team, and now I've kind of looped back in my career in the last couple of years. And so now I'm working again uh, with the Photoshop team. Uh, this application, how many people here have used it? Okay, almost everybody. How many people here think they know it? <laughs> my hand is not up. Okay. Um, I, one of the greatest compliments of my career was I, at one point, uh, Mark Hamburg, who was the lead on, on Photoshop, uh, uh, somebody asked him how he could possibly know so much about Photoshop, and does he know everything about Photoshop? And he said, no, I'm only able now to hold half of Photoshop in my head, but that's okay, Sean has the other half. Um, I, a very compliment, you know, a great compliment. I don't think it was ever quite true, uh, uh, but that was 20-something years ago, right? This application is a beast. If you just look at the Windows menu, um, I've got a few palettes up. Those are all the palettes in Photoshop, right? How many people know that you can edit full 3D models in Photoshop and composite them into your world? Like one person, two, three people, right? There's a complete 3D engine inside of Photoshop, if you didn't know. How many people knew that you could edit video inside of Photoshop? Ah, one person. So there's a complete timeline editor inside of Photoshop. So if you want to do something like, like correct the lens warp of a bunch of panoramic images and stitch them into a video, uh, you can do that inside of Photoshop. Or you can take your 4K video and dump it in and apply Gaussian blur inside of Photoshop across a set of frames. Right? So there is a complete video editor inside of Photoshop. Uh, uh, just things like uh, uh, the layer effects panel inside of Photoshop, if I just brought this up. Uh, uh, this is probably more human interface in this one dialog box than most applications have in their entire application. Okay. Uh, so this is a huge application, right? At, at, at one point years ago, uh, uh, we had to, to uh, send off the strings for translation. They had to be redone, and the translators came back and said, yeah, we allocated a couple weeks to go redo this whole, whole thing. And we said, you understand that there are 10,000 strings in Photoshop. So they were like, well, no, we just have to translate the ones that are user visible. It's like, yeah, there's over 10,000 user visible strings inside of Photoshop. Okay? So this thing's a beast. So uh, 
one more thing I want to mention before I leave Photoshop is kind of top right panel there. Uh, that's a system that I worked on in Photoshop called Actions, and it's a scripting system. Um, uh, at one point, I, it might still even be true, uh, there were more actions for Photoshop than there were in, in uh, 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 any other application, domain-specific uh, uh, programming language, including uh, Visual Basic for Word. Uh, that may or may not be true today, I don't know, um, uh, but it certainly ranks up, up there. An interesting thing about Photoshop Actions is there's no textual description of them and there's no good way to actually go in and kind of textually edit them. Uh, what makes, in my opinion, Photoshop Actions so successful is that you can record what you do and they capture not what was actually done, but what the user's intent was. So my canonical example for that is if you're resizing an image, you go into a complicated dialogue, um, uh, you say that you, you, know, you click around on a bunch of fields and you click on OK, and what you said in that dialogue box was that you wanted your document to be three inches wide constraining proportions. What the application does is it makes your document 500 pixels by 400 pixels. But what gets recorded is make your document three inches wide, constraining proportions, right? So it has this notion of doing smart recording so that you end up with a script that you can play back on other documents and it will do what you wanted, right? So that's what capturing intent is. Um, so let's go back here. So when I think about user interfaces, I try to put things into what I call the taxonomy of everything. Okay, it's a simple way to break down the world to take a look at it. You've got objects, you've got properties of those objects, you've got collections of objects, you've got operations on those objects, and you've got relationships between objects, okay? So that's my taxonomy of everything. You can almost describe the entire world, we can describe everything in this room in those terms. Right? The classic way to think about building a human interface is this, model view controller. And this definition is one of the most uh, uh, horribly abused, uh, just MVC, uh, uh, for model view controller, people just redefine it to mean what they want, right? right? Don't do that. So this is the definition that comes out of design patterns, uh, which also comes directly uh, from the original work on small talk. Uh, MVC consists of three kinds of objects. The model is the application object, okay? The view is its screen presentation, right? The view is what you see. And the controller defines the way user, the user interface reacts to user input, okay? So the controller, in some sense, is the keyboard. It's the thing that's feeding events into this system. So the flow of model view controller, some could argue maybe it should be called controller model view, uh, but this is the flow through the system, right? Right. Now, this is not the definition that you'll find if you look on Apple's website, although after me complaining about this much, uh, so much, Apple has actually changed their website, so that it's got a little footnote that says this is not classic model view controller. This is the definition of what we call model view controller. Um, uh, you know, you'll hear Microsoft say we have model view view model, and there's no controller in there whatsoever, and that's abuse in my opinion. You're taking the same terms and you're redefining them. These are well-established terms, and this is actually a very solid pattern. So how did it get so screwed up? Um, uh, I had a hypothesis several years ago uh, that where model view controller got so screwed up was actually with the Lisa, right? The Lisa was created by the folks at Xerox PARC who worked on Smalltalk, who understood model view controller, and they went out and they created Lisa. And Lisa does not follow a classic model view controller pattern. 
And everybody after the Lisa, the Mac team, the Windows team, has copied what was done on the Lisa team. Uh, so I went to a member of the original Lisa team, uh, uh, Rudy Sherry, um, and I asked him, I said, here's my hypothesis. You guys understood what Model View Controller was, but you weren't working in Smalltalk anymore. You were working in Pascal or Object Pascal. And so you had huge difficulty writing an observer. You couldn't observe your model. Okay. So you lifted parts of the model into the UI. And he said, yeah, oh yeah, exactly. We cut a whole bunch of corners in building it. Right? Right? So here's a case in history where you had people who understood the correct way to do things, okay, who cut a bunch of corners, and then for the next 30 years, it'll probably be 30 plus years soon, the rest of the industry has copied those mistakes and been confused by those mistakes. Right? So I'd kind of encourage you all, if you're interested in user interfaces, go back to some of the original small talk work, go back to the old small talk book, and read about how it was done then. I wrote a whole uh, little blog post. There's the link for it. You can find almost everything either off the stlab.cc website or sean-parent uh, slash stlab. These slides will be available for you later, so you don't have to copy that down, uh, about kind of the history of MVC. So in order to build a UI, we need to build an, an observable model, right? The model is the application object. And a lot of people think of the model as just being the data, right? But it's not just the data. It's the objects, it's the operations, okay, that you can perform on those objects, and it's the relationship between those objects. And you have to take that whole collection of things and make it observable to the user, right? So controllers end up binding to our operations. A trivial controller is something that just sets a property, okay? Views bind to objects and their properties in order to display them. So a view controller, right, unlike what Apple will tell you, uh, a view controller is, is a controller widget, something like a checkbox. It's a combination of the controller, it's going to issue events to your model, and a view, and that it's displaying. Okay, it's gonna have a little logic in there so that it can interpret, so that the controller side can interpret events based off what it's displaying from the view portion. Okay, so objects. Objects have a set of operations, right? And these should look very familiar. These are the operations that you would kind of have on a regular type. Right? You have some way to construct it. You're going to have a copy constructor of some, some sort, some way to make a copy. Objects exist within a space. They have a location, therefore I can move an object. Okay? I can delete or destruct an object. Objects have properties. Uh, uh, all objects have a location. They have to exist in a space. They have a size. They consume some amount of space. Uh, uh, and Commonly, they have a name, okay? We can call them something, right? And you see this surfaced inside of, of applications, right? In the terminology that we use. We're going to construct a new layer. How do we do that? We do it with new, which is a very programming term, okay? I want to create a new layer or a new background from a layer or a new group or a new group from layers. Right? We associate visual, visual constructs like names, icons, and behaviors with semantics. Right? Human interface is a language. It is a way to communicate with the user. And program operations like construct have specific command, semantics. In the HI, we associate those semantics with particular controls. Right. This is an old screenshot of Gmail. So why am I putting this up here? Well, in 2009, I left Adobe and I went to work at Google for about a year. And this was the closest to a screenshot that I could find for what Gmail looked like at that time. This actually goes back a little older. 
Um, uh, but I didn't save a screenshot at that time, so I had to hunt down something that looked the same on the web. So I stole this from the internet. Um, so I'm relatively new at Google. I've got a meeting uh, with members of the Google executive staff, and it's an important meeting. It's the kind of meeting where if you don't show up to the meeting, you should probably just turn in your badge and go home. And I get a phone call for a family emergency. And it's the kind of family emergency where your heart stops. And I have to go to address this family emergency. So before I leave, I want to send off a very quick email to just say, I will not make this meeting. Okay? Just one line, send it to my boss. I will not make this meeting. And I pull up Gmail, and I'm in a total, utter panic. And I say, how do I create a new email? Okay. It wasn't the first time I had used Gmail. I had been using it for a while. Okay. And I pull this up and I look. New, 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 new. Where's new? I don't see new. Okay. Well, new is an action. An action is a button. Where's the button to create a new email? Right? There isn't one. And the clock in my head at least is ticking. You know, probably seemed like 20 minutes. It was probably just 30 seconds. Um, but I was in a panic. How in the F do I create a new email? Okay. I can't find it. Why can't I find it? Right? Everybody sees it here, right? There's compose mail. But it's a link. What are the semantics of a link? Takes you somewhere else. Construction is not a place. Okay? <laughs> it's not. So in a planic, I couldn't find it. I could not decode this UI. Right? Right? Eventually I was like, ah, there it is, and then I'm cursing at my machine. I send off my email, and I go off and I resolve my family emergency, and I come back in, and I'm not fired, and I'm thankful for that. Um, and I send off a flaming email, right? Right? How can anybody create this UI? Right? So this is what Gmail looks like now. It's a button that says compose. I don't know if it's a red because of me, but it's been red ever since. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, uh, that matters, right? A button is an action. A button does something. I still think it should say, like, new email there and not just compose, but at least it's not a link anymore. Okay? It is better. So, semantics matter. So, collections. Right? If we have a collection of objects, we have a set of operations on that collection. Right? We can insert items in the collection. We can remove things from the collection. There's a count of items within the collection. Right? And there's a whole part relationship between the objects that are in the collection and the collection itself. Okay? So large collections pose a problem. Right? How do you observe a large collection interacti interactively and allow the user to arrange and filter and browse a large collection? Right? This is a very common problem in building human interfaces. Right? This is largely the problem of search. Right? You go to Google and you search for things, and there's an infinite number of results, and they have to figure out how do we display them to you in a meaningful way okay, with the things on top, and let you browse through them. So they've kind of done that with a paging interface, so you can flip through pages. Okay. So I like to give out some practical advice here, right? So if you're faced with a large collection of things, a very common thing that you're going to want to do is to be able to give the user a window into that collection Okay, and let them operate just within that window. And you can do that more efficiently than you can 
within the, the collection as a whole. Okay? And oftentimes I see user interfaces that don't scale and get very slow when you have a large collection. Who's ever had an application where it's like, oh, well, it worked well with, with 10 items or 20 items, but you put 1,000 items in there and the user interface just slugs along, right? It feels horrible, okay? So a very common thing that you might wanna do is show the user a range within a collection that's sorted, right? So our challenge here is we want to sort everything from SF to SL, okay? So how many people now know their uh, STL algorithms, okay? How am I gonna do that? Where do I start? Nth element, and I heard a partial sort, okay? So partial sort is part of the answer, but it won't give us this. Nth element is where we're gonna start. Okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna sort in the middle there, okay, as if the entire range were sorted, but we don't care about everything above and below. What's that? Ah. And then sort in between. Let's see what we can do here. Okay. So, what we want to do is we're going to start with nth element and we're going to pin our first guy. Right? That will get six into the right place. Just looking at the data there that's a little grayed out, nth element did something else. Anybody know what it did? It partitioned the set. You guys are way better than you were a few years ago. I'm paying attention here. Okay, it partitioned the set. So that means that everything up there is less than or equal to, and everything down there is greater than or equal to. Right? So now, we still need to get those guys, okay? So partial sort, right? So partial sort. So we don't care about that guy, so we get to skip over him now, right? He's already in the right place. And now we can call partial sort for the remaining elements, and that will give us that, right? Partial sort does what we want, but only at the start of a range. Because nth element left our range partitioned, okay? we know that we can just now do a partial sort on the remaining pieces. Okay, so now uh, uh, if our two boundaries are equal, then we're just gonna return. Uh, we don't have to do nth element if we're right at the start of the range, we can just do partial sort. And now we got a handy little algorithm, sort subrange. Marshall can go stick this in the standard now, okay? Very handy. Okay, so sort subrange does exactly what we want, right? And in practice, this will usually be an order of magnitude or so faster than sorting the entire sequence, right? If you're doing graphics work and you do need to do things like take a, uh, a, a median, but where you want a, a, a windowed median uh, around things, this is also a good technique for calculating things like that. Okay, faster than sorting your entire range and slicing out the data that you want out of the middle, right? And if you wanna grow this window because the user scrolls down, you can just do additional partial sorts, right? Because our data is still partitioned. So we can still leverage that. Okay. So operations act on one or more objects, additional objects, Operations to the arguments are bound as, as uh, to the operation as properties. What do I mean by that? If you go into a user interface, typically what you'll see is you pull up some dialog, right? right? Or it could be a visual interface, you construct things. So what you're doing there within the dialog is you are, are setting a set of properties, but usually those are not properties directly on the document. Those are the arguments to the command that, you, that you're going to issue. Right? And it doesn't matter if you go in and you're dragging about handles or things like that. What you're doing is you're constructing a command which you're then going to issue to the application. Okay? 
Operations are represented by buttons, menu items, gestures, tools, right, or direct manipulation. Subject or target of an operation is identified by a selection, right, or by direct manipulation, right? I can go and select a bunch of guys, or I can just go in and pick one guy and do something with it. Common metaphors in human interface. Okay. So selections. Selecting objects within a hierarchy specifies one or more as target paths, right? So you typically build a hierarchy within your application. So you have application, which contains documents, which contains objects within that. Those objects may contain other, other objects. And going back to the original Macintosh, and even before that to the Lisa, that got surfaced up into the menu, right? So if you look here, on the left side we have, have Apple. What does that represent? It represents things that you can do to the machine as a whole, okay? And then the Photoshop menu. These are things that apply to the application as a whole. And the file menu, things that apply to the document as a whole, okay? And the edit menu, things that apply to the currently selected object within that document. So if you think about it, that currently selected object within the document is a leaf node within that hierarchy that you can trace back to the root. What document are we talking about? The document that contains the currently selected object, right? Not any document. We're talking about a particular document, right? Within the currently selected application on the current machine, right? So that creates a path. So interval sets, Boost has a library called interval sets. Um, uh, the Boost structure is a little complicated. I prefer just encoding interval sets directly within a vector. Um, uh, uh, but nevertheless, an interval set is a good data structure to represent a selection, right? It lets me represent um, uh, uh, a disjoint collection of objects quite efficiently. You can even create two-dimensional interval sets. For anybody who did early work on a Macintosh, uh, a quick draw region is an example of a two-dimensional interval set. Okay. So in my um, uh, C++ seasoning talk, in the no raw loop section, I presented this algorithm, the gather algorithm, right? Marshall Cloud gets credit for the name for this algorithm, okay? And that's what you're doing. You're taking this collection of disjoint selected things and you're dragging them to a particular location within your collection. How many people have seen that talk? So, yeah, most everybody. It's a popular talk, so it's done well. So I'm gonna cruise through this kind of fast, right? The way that this breaks down is as two calls to stable partition. So we can do stable partition on the lower half, and we can invert our predicate, and we can do stable partition on the upper half, okay? And that gives us the gather function, okay? So next time you're frustrated in an application because you can't create a disjoint selection and drag things to one place, you can point them to my talk and say, please go watch Sean's talk and fix your application. So it drives me nuts. Um, uh, so that's that. But I don't want to talk directly about that, right? It also returns the two points. What I really want to talk about is stable partition. Okay? Why do I want to talk about stable partition? Okay, so that's stable partition. Who here knows how to write stable partition? Anybody? Ah, you get to learn how to write stable partition. Okay, so, so for most algorithms, they fall into one or two categories, right? For most algorithms, you can either say, okay, I'm going to start at the beginning of my sequence, and I'm going to assume uh, uh, that now I'm at some point n, and that everything behind me magically satisfies whatever I'm trying to do with the algorithm, and so now I fig need to figure out how do I make the next guy satisfy that. So I'm going to linearly go through my sequence and do that. Uh, the other common thing is to say, well, what if I could just jump to the middle, everything to my left 
satisfied uh, my algorithm and everything to the right satisfied my algorithm. And now I just need a way to merge those two things so that the whole thing satisfies the algorithm. Okay, those are the two most common approaches to satisfying an algorithmic job. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say, well, imagine that we could just cut this thing in half, okay? And that the top half formed a stable partition and the bottom half formed a stable partition. How would we do that? Well, we would call stable partition on both halves, okay? Then the problem becomes, how do I put those pieces in the right order, right? right? Between the top arrow and the bottom arrow and my midpoint, those are the pieces that are in the wrong order, right? Who sees? What do I call here? One person, I have to say it, that's obviously a rotate, okay? So we're gonna call rotate, put those pieces together. Okay, rotate is going to return our partition point, which is our new midpoint, so we can return that. Okay, so now all we need is our inductive base. Okay, so when we get down to just a one element window, okay, if it's selected, what's the answer, what do we return for a stable partition of the selected guy? Right? Okay? If it's selected, we're going to return right after it. If it's not selected, we're just going to return where it is. Okay? So the R there is our result. If it's not selected, we return the element we're looking at. If it is selected, we return one after it. Okay. So that's our inductive base. So now we just need to fill out handling N so that we can calculate our midpoint and we need to make sure that we handle the zero case where things are completely empty, in which case the result is just returning first. And that's an implementation of stable partition. Why am I showing this to you? There's something amazing, I think, in this algorithm. Let's see if I can point it out here. Okay. Right there. What's amazing about that? Every time I look at this piece of code, I'm just like, oh, that is so beautiful. The predicate is called only once per element, and it's called on that element before that element has moved. Okay, think about it. We're going to do a stable partition on a bunch of selected guys. We're gonna recurse all the way down to the leaf nodes. We're gonna ask the element exactly one time, are you selected or not selected? And then we're gonna put everything in the right place back up the tree, okay? So there are only n calls to p, and all of those calls happened before p was, before the item at the location was moved, okay? What does that mean? There's the magic spot. It means that there's another algorithm hidden in here, right? It means that we can do a stable partition without having to look at each item to say, are you selected, but to say, is your position selected? Which means that we can keep our selection out of our data. Okay? So we don't have to go stick a bunch of Booleans in our big, huge list of things so that we can mark them to say, are you selected? We can keep an interval set over on the side to say, are you selected? and we can still apply gather to put everything in the right place. Right, I think that's very beautiful. Do you guys think that's beautiful? Do you guys follow it? Yeah? Okay. So we can do something like this, right? We can have our interval set that represents our selection, the user modifies it a bunch, and then we can say gather position and put everything into the right place. Okay, so selections. Multi-select is only sporadically implemented in applications. It is always, and I say this pretty much unqualified, always inconsistently. How do I know that? So a few years ago, uh, Yako Yarve uh, 
Uh, at the time, he was a professor at Texas A&M. I think now he's at University of Oslo. He and I have collaborated a lot. Um, uh, he's largely responsible for lambdas in C++, so you have him to thank for lambdas. He also wrote the Lambda library that was in Boost. Uh, 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 he and I sat down to write a different paper about collections and user interfaces on collections. And we got hung up on selections. What did it mean to select things within applications? And we went and did a survey of a whole bunch of applications, which are referenced in this paper. Find it on my website. And we found like every application implements multiple selections differently. And you think it's kind of easy, right? Because you say, well, I can click on something, and then I can shift click someplace else, and that should select a range. And then I can command click someplace to make it a disjoint range. Okay. But what happens if I shift click and nothing was selected? Right? Or what happens if I command click on something that was already selected? Or the range that I'm shift clicking across had things that were selected within that range. Every application implements those differently. Right? Call it an artifact of implementation. The problem with that is it both means that there's no central design for it. There's nothing that a user can rely upon when a user is building selections. Okay, so users find it very confusing and users don't trust the system. Okay, it also means that nobody's written a good generic piece of code on that. So Yako and I ended up not writing the paper we intended to write. We just wrote a paper on selections and kind of a common vocabulary for how you would construct, construct selections. Okay, so it's a bit of a mathematical paper, uh, uh, but it's also a universal form for talking about selections, whether you're selecting things within a sequence or objects within an arbitrary space, it scales to n dimensions, right? So it's a nice little piece of work. So if you're implementing an application where you have collections of things and you need to select them, I'd recommend reading the paper. Um, that brings us to relationships, right? So a relationship is the way that two entities are connected. Relationships within software are unavoidable. Relationships come up a lot in my talks. I would say the problem with computer scientists are that we're bad at relationships. Right? That's my joke. So a structure is formed by, collected, by connected relationships. That's what a mathematical structure is, is a set of connected relationships. And architecture is the art and design of designing structures. That's the definition of architecture, right? The reason why some of us uh, are called software architects is because we're the people who are worried about the relationships of how the software is put together, and it's our responsibility to design those structures. Right? I find a lot of software architects with that in their title who can't give me a definition of what software architecture is. But that's what software architecture is. Okay? It's designing the structure of relationships, how the components within your software connect. A relationship always implies a corresponding predicate that tests if the pair are in the relationship or not, right? So you can be in a relationship. I happen to know that uh, Marshall is married. Uh, so, so Marshall is married to his wife. And so there's a corresponding predicate that I can ask, is Marshall married, right? Very simple. Within an HI, Relationships can be very challenging to represent and to convey to the user. So look at this picture for a moment. So this was my hotel room when I gave this talk in Berlin. It's not quite as bad as the picture would make you think to begin with there. You're looking at the shower okay, and the toilet. Um, what you can't quite see is there is a a clear plane of glass right between the two. There's no mirrors in this picture. Okay. This just struck me as funny. All right. So I thought somewhere out there, there's an interior designer who missed their calling. They should have been a software engineer. <laughs> okay. Because somebody gave them this requirement, 
they said, I want you to design a bathroom, and I want you to have at least one shower in the bathroom. And the designer said, okay, number of showers is equal to one. Constraint satisfied. <laughs> and somebody came along and said, oh, and that bathroom should have at least one toilet. The designer said, I can do that. Number of toilets is equal to one. Constraint satisfied. And so the owner of the hotel came back and said, and this bathroom should provide some privacy. They said, privacy should be greater than or equal to zero. <laughs> privacy is equal to zero. <laughs> Constraint satisfied. <laughs> Clearly missed their call. <laughs> so one of the simplest relationships that you'll run across in software, and one of the most common, is the implies relationship. A implies B. Okay, how common is this? Well, I just pulled up the manual for Clang and searched for the word implies or implied, and this is the number of cases where, where it occurs, right? So those options imply some other option. This option is implied by some other option. Okay, it comes up a lot. So if you were constructing a user interface and putting checkboxes on each of these options, you would want some way to represent that implies relationship to the user. Okay, so let's take a look here. I built a little app. This is an iOS app that I built and it's just gonna keep running in a loop here. And the user can click through things, and the operation that's getting applied um, uh, uh, after the dot, dot, dot there, right, we need to make sure that B is consistent with the implies relationship. So in the code, the user wrote this piece of code for the operation, and they said, oh, uh, uh, I'm going to take two arguments, A and B, but I'm going to say B is equal to A or B right inside, right, which means A implies B. And I'm just going to put an unconstrained user interface attached to that, and the user can click on anything. Okay? And the operation works, right? And we get a little green light every time it does the operation. The application works, okay? But somebody in QE is going to come along and say, say, that's all very nice, but when I say do A and not B, it still does B. Okay? And I didn't see that in the UI. So the engineer says, I can fix that bug. No problem. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, if switch A is on, then set switch B to be on. OK? Fix the bug. OK? And now I'm just going to, I don't need the code anymore to fix up B, so I'm just going to change it to an assert to make sure I got my code right. OK? Are we good? Yeah, who sees the bug? I know one person laughing. Yeah, a couple people see the bug, right? So what happens here? We can do that, and we're good. Uh, we can click on B. Yeah, we're still good. Uh, we can unclick B and click A. B gets clicked over. Hey, we're still good. We can unclick B. Boom, our assert fires. Okay, and we crash. Right? Everybody see why? Right? Right? We fixed it up, but only along one path of direction, only when A changed. Okay, so that generates another bug, goes back to the engineer. So the engineer is very happy that he at least got the, the assert, so he's using strong preconditions and asserting them. Soon we're gonna have uh, design by contract in the language, so we could have made that a contract. Okay, so here's what the user does. He says, okay, switch B is only going to be enabled if A is not on, okay? And if switch A gets turned on, then switch B will get set to true, okay? So now we're preventing that other case, right? Our switch is disabling. And we're happy here. What's the next bug that gets generated? Right? This all works. This is good. You could ship this product. Okay. Well, 
If you work with the designers that I work with, they're going to come along and they're going to say, hey, there's a rule here that says that if I toggle a control, if I toggle a checkbox on and off, then the system should go back to its previous state. Okay? So what happens here? I click A on, B goes to off, I unclick A, B doesn't go back to its previous state. Okay? So I'm violating one of my designer's rules. So we could fix that. Okay? So what are we going to have to do now? Now we're going to have to keep some shadow state to remember what the state of B was. Okay? And then, Switch B, whether or not it's on or off, is going to be, if switch A is on, then it's on, or it's going to be its prior value for switch B. Okay? Our logic gets a little more complicated. Okay. So now it's very nice if I toggle A on and off, then B goes back to its previous state, regardless of what it was. Okay? We're happy. We ship the product again. You know, the designer comes back and says, you know, users have a problem. They don't know why B is disabled. Right? Why can't I click on B? Okay. And the engineer says, I know logic. There's this thing called a contrapositive. Okay? Which means that if A implies B, then not B implies not A. So how about if we express that in the code? Okay? So not B implies not A. Okay, and I know that my toggle should always go back in the right po position, so now I'm going to keep memory on A and B, and I'm going to express both of those relationships, and I'm going to put that together, and this is the UI that I'm going to build. Now you can kind of watch this for a minute as it's clicking through a bunch of states here. <laughs> what the hell? Right? Right? Try to predict what's going to happen. <laughs> okay. This is completely correct. My operation always succeeds. I'm obeying my rule that says when I click on this, it toggles the user interface. It clicks back and forth. I don't have to explain to my user why my thing is disabled because it's always enabled. I can click anywhere at any time and something unexpected and magical will happen. And I'm standing on one foot and I'm patting myself on the head. Okay? Okay. So, we can say, okay, okay, the memory was too much. We'll go back to contrapositive, but we'll take out the memory and we'll do that. And we have another user interface, and it works. People are somewhat happy again, and we'll ship this one again. Okay, so now we've shipped three versions of this. We've rejected three versions. Only one of those three versions was buggy. We have six versions of this code. We had two checkboxes. We have now spent days and days and days arguing about the behavior of this, okay? And we will do it again the next time we have a relationship of A implies B, okay? Because we never defined what the rule was. What's the correct answer? Of the three that we shipped, what's the correct answer? I don't know, okay? So we'll have this argument every single time. While I was putting together these slides, Oh, I was going to say another operation would be that we could do it uh, 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 unconstrained here. And that looks like that. Completely unconstrained, but with the disabling operations. Well, I was putting together these slides. This came across our Slack channel. This is a sketch from one of our designers. It's got some humorous text down here at the bottom. You probably can't read it. Uh, you know, it says a uh, hidden layer and a normal layer in a hidden group, uh, uh, walk into a bar. Uh -huh. um, uh, uh, but the question here is to say, okay, I've got a layer and I've got a child of the layer and the layer is, the, the root is hidden. And so that implies that the child is hidden. And then I'm making uh, the child layer, which is what's selected in blue down below, explicitly visible and it's actually part of a multiple selection. And that has an implication of relationships with its parent at A, okay? So in order for the child to be actually visible, the parent also has to be visible. 
And he asks, how do I do this? Right? right? My answer is, I can give you a lot of ways you can do this. Right? The question should be, how do we do this in general? What's the rule that we're going to follow always? Okay, let's stop having this conversation over and over and over again. The industry is very bad at this. So what is a good design, right? In this context, we were talking toggling a control should restore the system to its original state. That's a good design goal. Result of a click should be predictable without knowing how current state was achieved. That's a good thing. You ought to be able to look at a user interface, know what will happen if you click on something, right? Guided paths, things that direct the user when we disable controls, things like that, are, are preferred so long as they don't make navigation difficult. The user has to understand why things are disabled, right? But there needs to be additional rules. All of these rules run into conflict as soon as you stick a simple relationship between elements under the hood, right? And the rules need to be derived from existing conventions, from user experience, and from studies. Right? So if you're working with a user interface designer, they shouldn't be sitting alone coming up with what their answer should be. They have to be looking at what does everybody else do? What, does, what do users expect? Do a user study to come to an understanding of what the correct answer is and then apply that consistently within the application. Okay. Now, I've spent a number of years working on a system called Property Models, uh, which has some amount of use inside of Adobe. Uh, I wish I could spend more time working on it. It's, uh, it's open sourced off of GitHub slash STLab. Uh, but all of the examples that I just showed, uh, this is the way you would express all of those relationships inside of a property model. They're all kind of one line, right? right? So I can build a system to let you express relationships and to solve these systems, but I still can't tell you what the right answer is. Right? So these are papers that I've written about property models and why they exist and how to build them. So algorithms for user interfaces, property models. Um, so closing here. Good code is necessary, right? But it's not sufficient for building a good UI. There's significant work in the area of data structures and algorithms to really support good UIs. I don't think our platform vendors do enough to assist us in this area, right? And there's still significant work remaining. Right? There's huge amounts of work every time I pick up a new application, install it on my phone or my laptop, right? I've been in this area of research for so long, I just cringe. Right? I can't make a selection. Selections are inconsistent. If I do make a selection, I can't apply the operations that I should be able to to the selection. Right? I can't drag and drop. Uh, I click on things and things disable and I don't know why. Right? One section of the application is inconsistent from the other section of the application. And it's true of even the products that I work on and I have a hand in because I'm just one engineer right, in a large company. So some references, um, uh, my slides will always be posted here, Sean Parent, stlab.cc slash papers and presentations. And you can find links to everything from there. Thank you for coming.